When the do-gooders started to send clothes to Africa for people who, who could benefit from, from that, my, uh, uh, my wife's family had connections with Africa. Her aunt was a nursing sister, sister uh, in, uh, in Durban during the Second World War. And I remember her saying, you could take one glance at a soldier and tell if it was a colonial or a, or, a, or a European, as the European soldiers, their legs were so bowed. The colonial people had better diets, so their legs were relatively straight. But, uh, when they started sending these polyesters to Africa, she said that you really had to keep your distance from any African wearing polyester <laughs> because of the unbearable stench that eventually evolved because the polyester does that and it's so durable and long-lasting, it takes two lifetimes to wear out a polyester garment. And if you wear it without laundering it frequently enough, the, the, the stench, body odors, and everything are so accentuated that, that it's sort of almost bothersome. Waterproof fabrics. Waterproof vapor permeable fabrics. Vapor permeable fabrics work and don't work if. Clothing insulators, down. All the others, lamellite, pointers on clothing designed for fit. Uh, so basically, you have to be knowledgeable enough to be able to accumulate a set of clothing that will meet your needs. You don't go to a wound without a spacesuit. You don't go, uh, you're not, you can't be active in the out of doors without being properly dressed and hope to be comfortable. And what the clothing is made of, like generally there's a tendency on mankind to say, I don't want to learn how to use this clothing. I want to buy this set of clothing, put it on and let it work for me on its own without any input from me. There you are, you're your own worst enemy. Because I would probably say that less than half of the issue is the ensemble you collected and more than half of the issue is the dynamics of its, of its usage and, its, and wearing it. It's a very dynamic process because it is so difficult. Maybe with electronics today, you'll start producing clothing that thinks for itself and uh, keeps changing to accommodate the various type of conditions that, that you know, from, from the uh, chill of the, of the uh, uh, late evening to the, the uh, heat of the late afternoon, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I have enough editing to do on this that it'll probably add a third more to this because I've been doing it. And, you know, it's like you read it and then you find where you want it and then you got all this pasted up, etc., etc. So uh, this is the book that a clothing designer better refer to if they're going to continue to design decent clothing for use in the outdoor, outdoors. There is your canoeist and your snowmobiler hot climates in particular, where you have to endure more ultraviolet. And then comes footwear. If your feet aren't comfortable, the rest of your body is, is quite miserable as well. All the different types of footwear and the relative merits. The United States Army Jungle Boot is a cross between the Rangzhou and a light, well-designed work boot. Probably one of the best designed pieces of footwear ever in existence. And that jungle boot that was so pre prevalent. And, and the only problem is that, I would use it summer and winter, but the rubber they use for making it, it's the slipperiest rubber you can ever imagine to use on ice. Problems relating to the lacing of boots. There's a Canadian military muckluck. Is the Canadian military muckluck, I think they call it the bunny boot sometimes. Then there is a all rubber boot that's got a valve in it just in case you, you know, at, at altitude you could get unusual pressure. So you got to be able to vent the, the, the way it's built. 
uh, it can hold uh, air, and it, and if it and, and the air expands as you go to altitude, that's called uh, Mickey Mouse boot. And that is the most vile invention ever imposed on any military organization. That particular boot, all rubber and so on, has probably ruined more feet than any other uh, single footwear. And if you <laughs> find it in a surplus store, be careful because if you <laughs> might wear it in the wrong context, it'll ruin your feet too. But the, uh, the bunny boot was uh, the, the Canadian military muckluck uh, was uh, designed after studying the Eskimo type of footwear used in the Arctic for many years. And the military muckluck is meant to use to the coldest temperatures imaginable. And if you're drinking coffee and you're standing around with those boots and you spill your coffee, if, the co if you don't feel it going to your boot, wet to your skin, there's something wrong with your, your clothing on some. If it's that porous, you don't have to use potato bags and so on, like I read about this Norwegian who was going across the Arctic, and he was having some serious problems with his footwear because he didn't know the, a lot of the fundamentals here. Two or three pairs of wool socks worn in the coldest part of winter and take a pail of water and put one foot into the pail of water till your socks are soaking wet, then go for a walk. If you're scared, run to the house. But you shouldn't be because you'll find that two pairs of, two or three pairs of good wool socks is the paragon by which you measure the quality of any winter footwear. And because you've gotten two or three pairs of wool socks in your boots, and I'm of the favor of three thick wool socks, and no matter what you're wearing right now, if I put my money where my mouth is, I should be wearing three pairs of thick wool socks right now because of the various, there's, there's about a dozen reasons why that's uh, useful to go that way. So when you hear me say that, you want to uh, try it until you finally say, well, you know, good for Morris, but not good for me. But uh, you know, when you wear that volume, any propensity to stinky feet will eventually go away on its own without using Desinex and all kinds of exotic stuff because you have enough volume. The worst stinky socks there are are thin nylons that have no absorption capacity and the bacteria that settle on that fiber immediately become to metabolize the oily stuff that you leave your fingerprints on. Their fingerprints are the same with the palms of your hands. There's an oil and a moisture to make it drip better. And they metabolize that moisture and they happen to be sulfurous and then you end up having stinky feet and you seem to have a hard time getting rid of them once you get the bug. But if you have a volume, that volume all absolutely instantaneously starts to remove any tendency to blistering. And when you lace your boot, it firmly locks your boot with a continuous pressure throughout the whole surface which is much more benign to you than a single sock will ever give you, etc., etc. So I would say a person with jungle boots that are big enough to be able to allow three thick wool socks properly laced, you're invincible because you have one of the, the most effective ways of dealing with your feet and protecting your feet, etc. The Roman legions conquered the world and they wore sandals. When I researched that, I learned a lot from the Roman legions. I'd have these university students come up to me and say, you know, I would pr help participate, I help officiate at this uh, cross-country skiing event, but I don't have any winter footwear. And I said, do you have any tibas <laughs> or, or sandals? Oh yeah, well, two or three wool socks. They were, they didn't have to come in and thaw out their feet like everybody else. Their feet were thoroughly comfortable wearing sandals to protect their soul, and they're wearing three socks in the snow officiating a cross-country ski meet. You, of course, will be annoyed sometimes by the amount of snow that gets between the sock and the sole of your, your boot, but you'll find that that is a very functional pair of footwear, maybe outdoes the Sorrells that the idiots in that foot company, hey, I don't have anybody there that's very scholarly and researchative and know very much about, otherwise they wouldn't design the type of boots they do. So heavy, so cumbersome, and, and really uh, not, uh, not adhering to the science of dressing. Now the military muckluck was made to be very, very porous. And then I, I probably worn out 20 pair, maybe, you know, two dozen pair, 
And one day I get a fairly fresh, you know, uh, used pair. And normally with the millet, those mucklucks, the first day, toasty, excellent. Second day, still really, really good. Third day, well, good. Fourth day, hmm, I better start drying my liners because if this persists. By the sixth day, you're really preoccupied with getting your liners dry. Well, all of that happened on the first day. And I said, what's going on here? And I looked and they had rubberized the mucklack up beyond the ankle because everybody said, you know, when we walk in puddles, we get, we get soaked. Well, you can't have your cake and eat it too. If you, and they, they without warning you, writing warning, this uh, mucklack has been rubberized on the inside beyond the ankle. That could cause you know, uh, frostbite to the feet or frozen feet because somebody lost sight in the in the whole structure and figured, oh, we're going to improve the muck like So the idiots ahead of us made them too porous. And then that porosity really bothers us because when we walk in slush or whatever, whatever, our feet get wet. Well, it's more important. You, slush might be bothersome, but freezing your feet off in the middle of uh, 40 degree below a week uh, is more important than than that sort of thing. Horse with the main boots, is it better to wear the socks and get rid of the liner? Oh no, no, I think, uh, I think the, uh, um, uh, the, the liners have their place. Uh, and, uh, and probably in the mucklock, again, uh, uh, the reason that I would say you should wear three socks in, in anything is that should you run into a calamity, just walking in your socks solves the problem, yeah. if you know what I mean. So if I go, go and fit myself out for cross-country ski boots, I would like to have enough sock that for some reason when my feet are on the verge of being freezing, I take off my boots and walk in the snow until my feet regain their circulation and warm up and so on, that I would use that ploy rather than trying to light a fire. I used to get such ice cold feet from the pressure of the ski boots because they were you know, didn't accept very many socks and that they're, they're kind of, the ski boots are, are uh, locked onto your feet because it's got something to do with you controlling the skis and so on. But, but if you find it, like for example, he's talking about the, the mucklock, you've got, you start with your feet. You could have one sock, then comes a kind of a slipper, like uh, they're moccasin patterns, and they come in pairs and they're called duffels because they're made out of a special woolen cloth called duffel that you can buy by the yard in the Bay Northern stores and so on. And, and the, uh, the two duffels, one goes way high up on the ankle, the other one much lower. And when the weather is warmer, you only wear one. When the weather gets colder, you wear the two duffels. And then when you, uh, the, the uh, snowmobile, there are snowmobile boots that are very much like uh, the outer, uh, outer boot that's made out of a fabric that's got a very nice sole. And in any any footwear that you use in the winter, the thick nylon mesh insole doubles the effectiveness of any footwear. So there is that big thick mesh. And in the military, they also have a great big thick belt one, which I find compromises uh, my ankle. I feel tittery, uh, teetery, and I don't really uh, feel the need to have that thick uh, belt insole. So I don't use it in the in the mucklock. Well, when you have that combination. That makes you invincible, provided you also have been schooled on the usage of, of this. And, and uh, like many things, um, well, I, you know, you get these uh, six foot six, six foot eight students who say that there is no Sorel made big enough for them. And I would say, well, three pairs of wool socks and then knit that outer sock and then put on a leather, nap leather sole or a rubberized sole, stitch it on that final sock that comes up quite high. Those are the people that pretty well were oblivious. They didn't have to pay much attention to their footwear. They did the best of all compared to any commercial footwear. And essentially they're wearing three thick wool socks and three exceptionally knitted outer, outer sock that has a sole to, because wool gets abraded very readily if you don't add protection to it in the right place. So it's not based on, you know, they, the difference between me and a lot of other people is I had these guinea pigs that were <laughs> continually coming back asking for counsel, <laughs> asking to be, to, uh, you know, 
all this sort of stuff where, and then uh, then whenever I give advice, then I try to keep track of it and see how well they did and see if I was in error. You know, to recommend to anyone that the best footwear uh, to me, except for winter ice, is, uh, is the, the, the jungle boot. Uh, I have to be able to feel that I, I don't want people coming back to me and say, you know, you gave me the worst advice possible. That uh, you, that almost cost me my seat because what you told me to do, you know, you got to be careful what you say when you're acting arrogant. Walking barefoot. When we would have people walk barefoot in this environment in the summer, we couldn't keep up with them. They were faster. You would think, well, I don't that must be dangerous walking barefoot in this. So what about the rose bushes? What about the sharp? They're totally inconsequential. Those ideas you come up with as a modern person, you're your you're, you're own worst enemy. <laughs> you should sort of say, well, I'm not going to say anything negative about walking barefoot until I've tried it. Well, I've had students do it, and I was quite impressed. And, and I had that attitude, well, I'm the leader, so I guess I shouldn't compromise myself. So if I'd have gone barefoot, then I would have put another feather in my hat with regard to what I experienced directly. But they did so well. Oh, that's, that's what they, did. they did so well that... How to use gaiters, overboots, foot troubles, first aid for blisters, anoraks. So on and so on. That's enough. Insects, that's anyway. Uh, this, uh, the uh, I skipped over a lot of stuff, but that was just to, you know, highlight some things. Um, there, are, there are three things that are poorly rendered in our current uh, current survival literature. In particular, there isn't much said by cl for clothing. Now, when you say survival manual, what is the implication? Is the implication you're going to get a hold of it and use that as a training aid? until finally one day you'll say I've learned everything in this manual and I don't carry it with me because it's excess baggage or is it a book that you bring along and you run into trouble and that's the first time you're dealing with that trouble trouble is, is reading this manual that you brought with you that gives you all the answers like the woodchuck manual you know Huey, Louie and Dewey Scrooge's nephews they every take with them a woodchuck manual and any time they ran into a problem well, when I was a teenager, I said, I'd like to get a hold of this woodchuck manual. And people said, it's a figment of the imagination. It doesn't exist. And I said, well, damn it, I'm going to write it then. <laughs> <laughs> so the bushcraft manual is the, is the beginning. It's probably one third of the manual. <laughs> and just shrink everything down to a much smaller printing and so on. But I've gotten over the notion that you take things with you. It's a little late to be learning how to swim. So you brought that swimming manual and say, well, I'll get out the manual and learn how to swim when I need it. Well, I'll get out the manual and I'll survive by referring to the manual. I don't know how you can learn. Uh, you can learn how to swim for a swimming manual, I suppose, but it's so much nicer to have an instructor directing you. And you're aware we're swimming, getting into the water and getting wet, and splashing, and then swimming a few feet, and then swimming 100 feet. There's a lot of work you've got to do to become. So when I say, the, see that island, and I say, Joe, see that island over there? Can you swim to that island? And Joe, looking. Okay. Yeah? And I say, Joe, how do you know you can swim to that island? And he'll say, well, I swam that distance many times before, and likely, hopefully, I can do it again. That's the answer. And uh, there are people that go for a walk on the dock, and they accidentally fall in the water, and they can't swim this far to get a hold of the piling to save their own life. That person better wear a, a life jacket. Then when you're out in the boat and you can't swim, all of a sudden the boat is singing, you say, gee, I wish I brought my life jacket. So, <laughs> you know, you, you, that analogy, I think, can be made to point out uh, the issue. Um, that uh, it's a little late learning how to swim when the boat is sinking out from under you in the middle of the lake. That is, there's an awful lot of stuff you're going to have to know, and then the authorities don't have to become embroiled in your rescue. And when we spend a billion dollars a year in Canada on search and rescue, the search and rescue clubs and, and whatever probably have more fun and camaraderie and all that. Uh, <laughs> but, but if you 
You know, Stephenson said, the more you attribute to the heroism of an explorer, the more you subtract from their intelligence. And of course, a lot of people weren't happy with that type of, uh, 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 you know, derogatory terminology. <coughs> anyway, any questions about clothing, if I might be able to answer any complexity? What's the best? The handouts. Hats. Uh, hmm? What's the best hats? Hat? Well, if you have a hat like this in the summer, and I just want to ask before you start, what have you got sewn in there? Sewn in there? Oh, I just repaired. Oh, I thought maybe you had a hat the, the thing there. there I think it was disintegrating, and I liked the hat so much, I did a kind of a quick stitch job okay, when I was no watching problem. television or something. Uh, a hat, a, a hat's a, a big chapter in the book, but for the general everyday hat, your your concern is eye protection. So when you have a hat that will allow the brim to go past the tip of your nose. So when you push into the bush, you don't rake your nose. And the brim is there really so that it prevents your eyes from being poked. And, um, and also, uh, so a little softer than you'll, you'll, you'll notice the Mexicans, they have a huge sombrero. Well, that's part of the way they dress in that they need protection from shade. So they have a very, they produce their own shade in the form of a, a hat that's more like an umbrella. And, and so on. Um, but yeah, it depends on what you're into. Um, a good hat is probably worth a thick wool sweater. So well chosen to protect your, your, your head. You lose a tremendous amount of heat from your head. Uh, your brain uses about four, almost 50% of the energy your body uh, processes goes to keep your brain going. And, uh, and a surprising amount of energy is required to keep the little muscles of your eyeball going. So between your brain and your muscle, it's a serious compromise if the blood vessels of your neck are, are that's why it's so easy to kill a person by choking them in the throat and choking them long enough and so on. So, so anyway, so it means that there's this tremendous amount of heat being lost and uh, you'll see that the neck doesn't usually build up with fat and that the head and so on will radiate. And the head is always being used as a means to dissipate extra heat. So the hat in the wintertime that, that uh, saves it. So I would say that in the winter, your headgear, uh, uh, you, uh, you don't want the wind to penetrate the headgear. One tooth might not be enough. You might have to have a very, uh, you know, you might have to have a fabric. Uh, another point that maybe I mentioned and didn't mention here again, um, we talked something about three thick, three, three wool sweaters, one thick, one medium, one thin, and two to the three, that's two times two is four times, that's eight different ways you can wear those three thicknesses. But if you have a tightly woven shirt that can go over all of your sweaters or between any layer of the sweaters, it would be kind of floppy and baggy to be worn alone. That, that vers that's a versatility that you can build into your clothing ensemble that, that might be, uh, you know, immen contribute immensely to your comfort. Is to have a, a, a very, um, um, if you woven tightly, it should be difficult for you to put it over your mouth and breathe. Like these, this type of shirt there, that's probably the right type of fabric to be able to put between any layer you wish. So that wouldn't be a woolen shirt.